Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you have to decide which intervention, among many, you want to implement at your health department? You have looked at the research evidence, and even though a number of interventions have been shown to be effective in practice, you have a finite budget and can only choose one. How do you decide which one to implement? You may have used the model of evidence-informed decision-making in public health, suggested by the National Collaborating Centre for Methods and Tools, to assist you in making your decision. If you were to use this model, in addition to looking at the research evidence, you would also look at the magnitude of the problem in your community, the resources needed to implement and maintain the intervention, as well as the societal and political preferences. Choosing the best combination of interventions can be very challenging even when the decision is limited to one problem within one program, such as implementing a vaccine promotion strategy using social media. The decision-making process becomes even more complicated when decisions across the spectrum of public health services are being made, for example, strategic planning initiatives. In these instances, decision makers may have to compare the benefits and resources required to maintain an environmental health intervention, such as monitoring swimming conditions at public beaches, to a chronic disease prevention intervention, such as a healthy eating campaign. Given limited resources, decision makers may need to consider carefully, across all public health programs, which interventions deliver the greatest impact for the required human and financial investment. Please view the other videos in this series to learn how to use relative risks, odds ratios, and confidence intervals in your decision making. These valuable concepts will give you an estimate of how likely the result is, whether it is statistically significant, and how large the effect is. What they don't tell you is who an intervention worked for or how many people had the desired outcome. They also don't tell you how many people need to receive the intervention in order to see one person with the desired outcome. To answer these questions, we can use a statistical measure called Number Needed to Treat, or NNT. It is defined as the number of people who need to receive an intervention in order for one person to experience a positive outcome or to avoid a negative one. NNTs can only be calculated when there are only two possible options for the outcome being measured. For example, initiating breastfeeding or not initiating breastfeeding. Currently, NNTs are not usually reported in the public health literature, but they are easy to calculate. Let's take a look at some public health examples to see just how easy it is to calculate and interpret them. Remember, the data presented here are hypothetical and are for demonstration purposes only. Let's say data were presented at a senior management meeting illustrating that teenage pregnancy rates are higher in your community than the provincial average. You've been asked to make recommendations to address this issue. After searching healthevidence.org, you find a recently published systematic review reporting that pregnancy prevention messages disseminated using social media lead to a statistically significant reduction in teenage pregnancy. Although a reduction in teenage pregnancy is the outcome you were hoping to see, you wonder how many teenagers need to receive the messages in order for one pregnancy to be prevented. Given there are only two options for the outcome, pregnant or not pregnant, you know that it is possible to calculate an NNT. Unfortunately, an NNT is not reported in the systematic review, so you'll need to calculate it yourself. The formula for calculating an NNT is 1 divided by the absolute risk reduction, also referred to as an ARR. It sounds complicated, but it really isn't. An ARR is simply the difference in rates of the outcome in the control group compared to the intervention group. Let's do the math. Say we have 1,000 teenagers in the intervention group who receive weekly messages over a one-year period about pregnancy prevention, and another 1,000 teenagers in a control group who do not. After one year, we see how many teenagers became pregnant in each group. We find there were 15 pregnancies in the intervention group and 30 pregnancies in the control group. The rate of pregnancy in the intervention group is the number of pregnancies divided by the total number of teenagers in the intervention group. In this case, 15 divided by 1,000, which equals 0.015. The rate of pregnancy in the control group is 30 divided by 1,000, or 0.030. We calculate the absolute risk reduction 
by subtracting 0.015 from 0.030, which gives us an ARR of 0.015. As mentioned earlier, to calculate the number needed to treat, we divide 1 by the ARR. So 1 divided by 0.015 gives us an NNT of 66.7. Because we can't have half a person pregnant or half a pregnancy, we round the NNT up to the nearest whole number, so our NNT is 67. Now we need to interpret what an NNT of 67 means. It means we would need to expose 67 teenagers to the intervention in order to prevent one pregnancy over a one-year period. This would constitute a relatively effective intervention, as few teenagers need to receive the intervention in order for one negative outcome, teenage pregnancy, to be avoided. Let's look at another example. Suppose you are planning a strategy to increase the number of properly installed car seats. A recently published meta-analysis reported on the effectiveness of holding clinics to promote the correct installation of car seats. The intervention consisted of staff assessing whether car seats were installed correctly and teaching people how to correctly install them. The control group received standard practice where people could call and request information on correct installation. One month after the intervention, cars were assessed to identify correctly installed car seats. Following data were reported in the meta-analysis. Among 500 people exposed to the intervention, 225 correctly installed their car seats compared to 195 in the control group. We calculate the event rate in the intervention group by dividing the number of correctly installed car seats by the total number of people in the intervention group. So, 225 divided by 500, which equals 0.45. Using the same formula, we divide 195 by 500, which gives us an event rate in the control group of 0.39. To calculate the ARR, we subtract 0.39 from 0.45, which gives us an ARR of 0.06. The NNT is calculated by dividing 1 by 0.06, which gives us an NNT of 16.67. We round that up to the next whole number, giving us an NNT of 17, which means that 17 people need to attend the clinic in order for one car seat to be correctly installed one month later. Now that we have determined how many people need to be exposed to these two interventions in order to either obtain one positive outcome or avoid one negative outcome, we can identify both the financial and human resources that will be required to achieve a meaningful outcome for the whole population. While there are other factors to consider in interpreting NNTs, such as the underlying risk of an outcome in specific populations, a general understanding of how to calculate and interpret them will provide public health decision makers with powerful information upon which they can make difficult program decisions. Generally, the smaller the NNT, the greater potential impact there will be at a population level. Sometimes an intervention can produce unanticipated negative outcomes or harms which should be considered when making a decision. To assess the magnitude of negative outcomes, we calculate the number needed to harm, or NNH. The NNH tells us how many people would need to be exposed to an intervention in order for one unintended negative outcome to be observed. For example, let's say we are considering an anti-bullying campaign. The evidence indicates that the campaign is effective in reducing the number of bullying episodes. However, more children exposed to the intervention report feeling isolated compared to those not exposed. You can calculate the NNH to determine how many students would need to be exposed to the intervention for one student to feel more isolated. This will help you weigh the benefits on an intervention against the potential harms. One final use of this calculation is the number needed to immunize, or NNI. It is calculated the same way as both the NNH and NNT and tells us the number of people who need to be immunized in order to avoid one negative outcome, such as death as a result of infection. You can see how NNTs would be helpful in adding information related to how many people would need to be exposed to an intervention in order for one person to experience the outcome of interest. Number needed to harm and number needed to immunize also provide useful information to decision makers along with number needed to treat. 
They are simple to calculate and most published studies provide sufficient data on outcome measures so that you can easily calculate them yourself. With a little practice, you will not only become confident in calculating NNTs, but also interpreting them and using them to inform decisions about public health interventions.